So this is unit zero for AP World History, also known as the Foundations Unit. So a long time ago, they used to teach 10,000 years of history. Now we teach about 820 years of history. But history doesn't start in 1200. It starts a long, long time ago. So you have to know what happened prior to this period of time. Just so we give credit where credit is due, this PowerPoint was created by Samantha Zoller, another teacher. Uh, if I make a PowerPoint, I'll let you know. Otherwise, I'm going to give credit to the person who actually made it. So there's this theory that about 100,000 years ago, we came out of Africa, all of us. It's this out of Africa theory. Now it is a theory, but it, in science, most of these theories are basically accepted, like gravity, drop an apple, it goes down. It's just things go down. Gravity. So this is a widely accepted theory that civilization started in Africa and we all moved out from there. So this was during the time known as the Paleolithic Age. So Paleolithic characteristics. You need to know that people were nomadic. They're moving from this area to this area. And they were hunter-gatherers. You had people who would hunt. You would have people who gathered and they would switch. It wasn't really like anyone had a specific job. They were simple stone tools. They've got a picture there on the PowerPoint. And it was known as a kinship-based clan. So you stuck with your family. You didn't just go off and join a bigger group. If your family died, maybe you'd find another group if you were lucky. And there was no full-time leaders, no specialized occupations. And oral language is starting to be created more like, Ugh, fire, that kind of oral language. And again, we created fire. So we started to cook our food. Fire. But then around 10,000 years ago, we start to realize, hey, what if we plant the things we gather? And this starts agriculture. This is known as the domesticating of plants. And we also start to domesticate animals. So we start to keep cows in one place and keep sheep in one place. That's domesticating them. So this is the Neolithic age. We start to go from moving around from place to place to settling down because if you plant seeds, you need to see what happens to them. You need to see if they grow, what comes out of those seeds. So you're gonna settle down in a permanent village. And when you settle down, populations start to procreate and make more. A result of the Neolithic age is the fact that we become less egalitarian. Egalitarian is a term that you need to know. Basically, it's that everyone's equal. Everyone deserves equal rights. But once we all started to settle into these bigger groups, populations became less egalitarian. Another result of all of this agriculture and all of us settling into these bigger groups of people and going from less kinship to bigger civilizations, epidemic diseases spread. <coughs> Too soon, man. Too soon. Villages become cities. Cities become these civilizations. Also, you have specialized labor. People start going into different fields. We go from just talking to writing. We write down our stories and populations increase. This is what happens. So what I just described to you were a bunch of changes throughout the Neolithic age, but we also have something that continued throughout this time. There's something known as pastoralism. So it's these semi-nomadic people who are going to herd animals. They forage, but they don't practice agriculture on this large scale. They're seen as barbaric by settled people. So while they're seen as barbaric, they're actually doing a good thing. So while you live in this village over here, these pastoralists come by and they notice all the technology that you have and all the things that you're doing. And they trade with you and then they go to the next village over here and they say, hey, that village over there, you should see what they're doing, what tools they've created. Let me trade with you with some of the tools and let me tell you the ideas that they've come up with. So what these pastoralists are doing is they're actually spreading culture and technology as they go. So it's actually a continuity over time that these people continue to exist. So now's the time to take a break because we're about to go into the next subject. So stop the video now, take a breather, take a day off, and then start this back up when we're ready to go on to the next part. Okay, ready to start? So now we're talking about the rise and fall of civilizations. 
So there's six things we really need to concentrate on this topic. So there's the first wave and they're known as the River Valley Civilizations. It's pretty clear as to why they're known as that. They start around the river valleys, obviously. The Nile River, the Tigris and the Euphrates, the Yellow River, the Indus, Mesoamerica's around this, Olmec, all of the water that's around there. It's really important. Typically, we would have talked about this had we gone over the 10,000 years of history, but aren't you lucky? We're just going to hit it and quit it. The second wave is known as the Classical Empires. This is the Romans and the Mayans and the Greeks. You still need to know about them vaguely. You kind of have to have a general idea as to when they were and where they were. This is around 600 BCE to 600 CE. Let's take a quick break here to talk about BC, AD, BCE, CE. You'll notice that I talk about BCE and CE. It just means before Common Era and Common Era. It's okay if you want to use BC and AD. Just what you shouldn't do is use BC and CE. When you're writing in this class, that wouldn't make any sense. BC means before Christ. AD means Anno Domino. My Latin's a little rusty, but it essentially means in the year of our Lord. Okay, fine. Before Common Era, Common Era takes the religion out of things. But if you're used to writing, B.C. and A.D., that's okay. The A.P. readers don't care. Be consistent. Just stay with the same ones. That's fine. Now back to the six things we really need to focus on. The first being this urbanization. This is when we start to move into cities. You're going to have Mesopotamian city-states. And if there's one thing you really need to know about me, I'm really bad at pronouncing cities, civilizations, names. So excuse me while I butcher all of these. Harappa, Mohenjo-Daro. I'm pretty sure I've said that right before. I don't know why I'm destroying it now. Persepolis, Constantinople, I could say that one. The others I'm just not going to try. But essentially, we're moving into cities. We're moving out of these little small areas, and we're, we're building cities up. This is what the first thing that's happening during this rise and fall of the city. So we're talking about the rise of cities. So the second thing that's happening during all these civilizations coming up is we have the stratification, the social hierarchy. We're having this inequality within society. Specializations are going to lead to these inequalities, and we're going to have law codes, which is going to reflect this inequality. I'm certain you've almost probably heard of this Hammurabi law code. This is what's going to develop during 600 BCE to 600 CE. The fallback with all of this is that wealth is going to pile up, not out. And we also have slavery, which is going to develop during this time. You may be very familiar with the Indian caste system, that's also going to develop during this time. This is just an example from the Hammurabi Law Code. If a man destroy the eye of another man, they shall destroy his eye. If one break a man's bone, they shall break his bone. If one destroy the eye of a free man or break the bone of a free man, he shall pay one gold mina. If one destroy the eye of a man's slave or break a bone of a man's slave, he shall pay one half his price. As you can tell, the life of a slave didn't mean as much. Still meant something, just not as much. Another important thing that's happening during the rise of these civilizations and these city-states is patriarchy. Because we didn't have the technology we have today, physical strength was needed for all this agricultural work. So farmland was outside the city, so women stayed in, at home. And some societies were less patriarchal. We all know about Cleopatra in Egypt. There were women ro rulers in Egypt, so that was nice. But unfortunately, in a lot of societies, patriarchy still ruled. So you have here a picture of the Sati ceremony in India. And if you've ever seen Game of Thrones, which it's a very violent show, I'm not sure why you were watching it, but if you've ever seen it, you know that the Queen of the Dragons girl, she gets into this fire after her husband dies. She survives it, spoiler alert. But that's kind of emulates this idea of the Sati ceremony in India. A woman was expected to jump on the fire after her husband was 
after he died. She would go into the fire. She was alive. He was gone. And if she didn't, she'd be forced into it. Something else that basically develops during this time is a bureaucracy. We still have bureaucracies today. Things that you need to know at that time was something known as a Persian satrap. That would be like a governor that was elected by the king to watch over a piece of land. We also have the Chinese merit-based bureaucrats, which are going to pop up over and over and over, and you need to know about the Chinese meritocracy. So this was started during the Tang Dynasty, and the Tang Dynasty was 618 to 907 or thereabouts. Dates are a little off here and there. But this was a testing-based system, so they would test people and see if they were you know, smart enough to really kind of find positions within their government. So a bureaucrat is someone who is not elected. Think of it like this in present day terms. So a bureaucracy is a system of government where the most important decisions are typically made by appointed officials rather than elected representatives. So think of it in terms of the American government. President is elected. Okay, the people elect the president. I know we have an electoral college, can be a little bit sticky, whatever you believe, but we elect the president. You do not elect the Secretary of State, Secretary of Education, Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of Agriculture, the Attorney General, and several other positions. All of those people are appointed by the president. This individual appoints all of these positions. These people are a part of the bureaucracy. They all make decisions every day that are very important, but they weren't elected. You elected this individual to make great decisions and pick these people, but you did not elect these people. So these people are the bureaucracy. During this time, there's also a huge emphasis on trade. So the way that governments made a lot of money was to tax the trade that went through the empire that would lead to a lot of money. They also needed to protect that trade because that was a really important government role. So of course that led to a lot of jobs. There were three really important trade routes we're going to talk about a little bit later, but just look at all of them here. They're all really good. The three really important ones though, just so you're aware of the Indian Ocean, the Silk Roads and the Trans-Saharan. Something else that's really important, our last step right here is the infrastructural and the monumental architecture. A lot of these things are still around today. We know that the Great Wall is still around. You've got ziggurats, the Roman roads, the aqueducts. A lot of these things we look at and we built on. So like our highway system, I know that the Germans looked at, we looked at theirs and we went, oh, that's great. We want to develop that. We developed that in America, but it was because of the Romans, the Romans did their Roman roads and we went, oh, that's perfect. Let's do what they're doing. But what goes up must go down. Why did these empires collapse? Well, they overextended. They, their borders got too big and they just couldn't maintain them over time. Or it comes down to corrupt politicians. Their economies fell, their peasants revolted. They taxed their elites too much. Or there were a lot of disease epidemics. It happens. Or they were invaded. So there were many different reasons all of these great empires fell apart. But in a way, it led the way for more empires to come around. All right, now's the time. Take another break, pause the video, because you don't want to do all this in one sitting. It's time for religion. Let's talk about all those good old Sami religions up to the year 1200 because you need to know all of them. The first one we're going to talk about is Judaism. The founder is Abraham. They are a monotheistic religion, which means that they have one God. They have the Ten Commandments. Their holy text is the Torah. The reason we talk about it is because they have these diasporic communities. A diasporic community just means that it's a dispersed community because of war politics, famine, etc. 
The next one is Hinduism. The founder is unknown. The beliefs that there are many forms of one God. Um, there's karma and reincarnation. What I've been told by former students is that there were 10 gods and they reincarnated over time. And now there's approximately 3 million, I believe. Uh, but please correct me if I'm incorrect on that. I know that uh, families tend to choose one God to more dedicate themselves to, more worship towards. But again, I could be incorrect. Hmm. The sacred texts are the Vedas. And the reason that we love to talk about this is the caste system and the fact that they have such cultural unity in India. The next one is Zoroastrianism. Of course, my fun fact about this is Freddie Mercury, the lead singer of Queen, was actually a practicer of Zoroastrianism, or his family was. The founder is a Zoroaster. They believe in free will, right versus wrong, final judgment. Uh, the sacred text is Zendavesta. They love this idea that it was actually Zoroastrianism that contributed to all this culture in Persia and influenced the later monotheistic religions in that area. So it's really important religion that a lot of people today still don't really know much about, but it's still going on. The next one is Buddhism, and I know that I say that incorrectly. I definitely don't put the, the accent where it's supposed to be. I've had many students try to correct me. I think it's Buddhism, and I still sound silly when I say it, and I apologize profusely. So I tend to say it was such a southern twang, Buddhism, and I don't mean any offense when I say it that way. I'm just terrible at pronouncing things, but I will try my best. Uh, the founder was Siddhartha Gautama. They believe in the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path. The sacred text is the Tripitaka, which again, I'm probably pronouncing wrong and I apologize. Uh, we love the, to research this is because it, it rejected the caste system. They have monastic communities and that's just basically the idea of having monks, which, you know, you, you kind of stay away from uh, other, you know, this materialistic lifestyle, you give a vow to your religion. Uh, they welcome women in lower classes, which a lot of religions at the time did not, and they, it spreads on the trade routes, and we'll talk a lot about that as we get to that section in our class. This is a more simplistic view of the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path, the idea that life sucks. Life sucks because you want things. If you don't want life to suck, you got to stop wanting stuff, and the Eightfold Path is the way to stop wanting stuff. It's simplistic, but in a way, it's not wrong. The next one is Christianity. The founder is Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus uh, is the Messiah in this religion, and it's monotheistic. Again, they, you know, one God. The sacred text is the Bible, more specifically the New Testament. They do kind of tack on the Old Testament, which is the Torah. That's it. AP loves it because it rejects the caste system. They have monastic communities instead of monks, they have, you know, nuns and uh, priests. They welcome women in the lower classes, depending on which, you know, version of Christianity you're in, which sect. Um, and it does spread on the trade routes. Next one is Islam. The founder is Muhammad. It is a monotheistic religion. They do believe in God, uh, Allah, what they call them. They have the five pillars. Uh, Mecca and Medina are their holy cities. You are expected to go to Mecca at least one time in your life. Their sacred text is the Quran. Uh, they uh, love it because it really does take over in the place of Zoroastrianism, but it's influenced a lot by Zoroastrianism. And it also provides a sense of unity in the Middle East. And we will talk a lot about this religion as time goes on. We really do have to mention polytheism as well in this uh, term, animism and sham shamanism, because these are going to pop up, especially in Native American cultures as time goes on. Uh, it's the belief that, the first one is the belief that focuses on, on the roles of various gods and spirits in the natural world and human life. And the shamans are basically the ones that can kind of relate to these spirits. So be familiar with these ideas because they're going to pop up, especially when we talk about like Korea and Central Asia and again, Native Americans. This here just kind of gives you a general idea as to like the world religions by percentage. As you see Christians kind of take up a lot. But it's, you know, that's also including Catholics in there. And Catholics in, in sects of different types of Christians really do see themselves as very different than Catholics. Um, and Muslims are really gaining up. There's, it's a huge growing religion. So it's, this, this is a little bit old, this data. And on the map here, you can kind of see where the bulk of major religions are. And yes, 
there are some religions that are in China, not a lot. It's more kind of like, it says other religions, but they're really kind of like non-religious. It depends. It's spread out. And especially in Christianity, when you're in Russia, you're Eastern Orthodox, not so much as like the, say the Christians you have in the South of America uh, versus the North of America. Um, it just depends. Religion is very different and very personal to people, but it will come up in this class. All right, now's the time to take a break. We're hitting the last part of this, but it would be nice to just kind of take a breather, like, because we just finished religions and we're moving on to trade. All right, you ready for the last three slides? I know, three more, here we go. We mentioned this on an earlier part of this video, the three trade routes I really wanted to concentrate on, and one of them was the Silk Road. This trade was mostly done on camel caravans, so you had a bunch of camels together, people on top of them, of course. That's how they traded. The cities, the major ones that they were kind of hitting were Samarkand and Kashgar. These were often dangerous routes because you had a lot of people trying to grab all the luxury products you had. So they were trying to stop you and grab what you had. That's, that's what made it so dangerous. When you went from the west to the east, you, people were trading for horses. And when you went from the east to the west, they were going for silk, porcelain, and paper. These are very important things that were traded along this route. The things that were traded, you know, you had chariots, horse stirrups, Buddhism went along this route, Christianity, oh, and disease. We're going to talk a lot a bit about that. So something else you really want to kind of mention is that bills of exchange. That was something that said, hey, I can't pay you now, but I will pay you next time you come through. That's a bill of exchange. Banking houses were also created during this time. Think of it like, oh, I don't know, a bank. Huh. And paper money. That's what makes this trade route so important. Need to know that. The next one is the Indian Ocean. So the big cities around this, of course, they're going to be around the Indian Ocean. You have Aden, Gujarat, and Calicut. They depended on the monsoon winds. These were the seasonal winds around here. You're not going to sail against the winds. You're going to sail with the winds. That makes sense. You're going to trade pigments, pearls, spices, and tropical fruits along this route. The big things that were traded also were Buddhism. This is how Buddhism got into Southeast Asia. Another things that came around during this time because of this route were the compass, the astrolabe, larger ship designs because you needed larger ships to go along this ocean, and the lateen sail, which you, of course, have a picture of on this slide. And the last one I really want to talk about is the Trans-Saharan. So this is going to go throughout Africa. It's two of the big cities. You've got Timbuktu and Gao. This is actually going to connect Europe to West Africa. You guys have probably already heard of Mansa Musa, and if you haven't, we'll talk about him, but this was a big deal because this connected Europe to his kingdom. So salt from the South and the West Sahara were traded, and gold from West Africa basically went along this route. Islam spread because of this route, and the camel saddle and the caravan went along this route. So this is what made this route so very, very important. So these are things you really need to know when it comes to trade. We'll talk more about it, but these three trade routes started before 1200, and they're going to continue after 1200. This is why this was so important to know this foundational unit, because history doesn't start in 1200. You need to know what happens before 1200 and what continues throughout 1200 and beyond. 